Hi folks, what can we do to improve the tool pass for machining the 3D surfacing on this part? Let's dive through both some tips and tricks, but also some general methodologies and tools that you can think about in improving your surface finishes. Welcome to another Fusion Friday. So the customer sent this file in with an existing cam setup. They have a 3D adaptive with a quarter inch end mill. Then they were coming through and doing a ramping operation with a 3 16 ball end mill and then a parallel operation to cover the top of the surfacing also with the same 3 16 end mill. So I give them a lot of credit. One of the things Fusion does a really good job of is explaining what some of these 3D operations and surfacing operations can be good for. And again, for the folks out there that have done surfacing machining for mold and die shops, this is probably gonna be boring and you should probably close this video. But for the rest of us that are trying to learn from scratch or start or figure out how to do stuff, this is awesome and this is really helpful. Understanding things like the ramp tool path is better for steep walls or that parallel is a really commonly used finishing strategy. That's actually helpful to understand. And really, I wouldn't say there's anything that's done wrong here, but let's talk through some changes I would make. Now, the customer didn't specifically say what they were going for here. I believe they're looking for what most of us are looking for, which is really good surface finishes on parts. That's not always the most important thing. Uh, other things that can matter are cycle time. You know, how long are you allowed to take to make the part? How long do you need your tools to last? Or, you know, is tool life an issue? Do you have the ability to use multiple tools or tool changes? Some people want to do more with the same tool so that they can let it run even lights out. So that being said, there are limitations based on the tools you have at your disposal. Here's what I would recommend. I'm going to duplicate their operation and we're going to do NYC CNC. Uh, we were spent some time playing around with this ahead of time, which is why we've got this pre-video test. I'm going to leave their original adaptive. And I'm going to change one thing on it, which is I'm going to increase the stock to leave, say, to 40 thousandths of an inch. Click OK. And we're going to delete the rest of the operations. The thought here is actually going back to Rob Lockwood's Autodesk University presentation on great surface finishes which is that when you do your final surfacing operation, you really want to present the tool with a consistent amount of material. And the problem with the first version of this toolpath is if we walk through the simulation, we finish the adaptive with a set of stairs. So as we start our parallel operation and we walk through it, that tool is going to see a very different amount of material as it walks up and down this part and interacts with the stairs that we've created. So I want to try to get away from that. So we start again with an adaptive. But what we're then going to do is duplicate that. And we're going to switch to a new tool. I've modeled it up here as tool 101, which is a quarter inch end mill. I love running quarter inch tools, especially on the Tormach machines, but the difference is instead of it being a square shouldered end mill, we've got a corner radius of 45 thousandths of an inch. Uh, we've actually been playing around with these lately in our shop for some different projects, uh, and they've been working out quite well. We'll put a link in, but here is an example of a quarter inch tool where you can purchase it with different corner radii. On the second tab, geometry, we'll check rest machining, change it from stock setup to previous operations, and we'll reduce the stock to leave to 20 thou. Click OK. First thing I noticed, which I wasn't expecting, was why, if it's a rest machining, why is it machining all of this material down here on the floor? Well, here's why. We changed the amount of axial stock to leave. On the first operation, it was 40 thou axial. And we want to keep it that way because axial isn't just the floor of the part, it's also all of the axial stock to leave along the surfacing part. And here, we've changed it to 20 thou. So what happens is that when we're done with this first operation, we've left that much material and we step down to the next tool, we've machined a little deeper. Awesome way to fix that. Let's hop into a browser. If you go to the library on NYC CNC and you type expressions, we'll get a post up with all of the cam expressions in Fusion 360. So I'm just gonna hit Control F to search. I'm gonna type axial stock to leave. So there is the Fusion 360 variable. I'm going to right click, copy for axial stock to leave. I copy it because it's case sensitive and the V is lowercase, but the S, T, and L are uppercase, so I don't want to deal with typing it in. 
So what we're going to do, again, we're in the first adaptive, edit, heights. Under bottom height, I'm going to change it from zero offset of model bottom to negative, and then paste in that value. That's going to lower the lowest point that the part can machine, and that's a good thing, because what's going to happen is now that first operation is going to go all the way to the bottom. Now, one quick note, if you go back in and you look at what that value is, it looks like Fusion changed it to a hard-coded value of negative 40 thousandths. It didn't. It kept it as a variable, and you can check that by right-clicking, edit expression, and you can see it's now listed as negative vertical stock to leave. I like this, you know, maybe overkill for a one-off job, but I like this because if we went in and changed the stock to leave here to say 0.05, it's going to flow through. It's just smart stuff. And frankly, it's pretty cool, I think. Perfect. I love it. The benefit is now, that this regenerates, our second rest machining adaptive with the bullnose tool isn't cutting all that extra material here on the floor. So let's take a look at what that simulation looks like. So when we finish the first adaptive, we've got those stairs. So now what we're going to come into is the rest machining adaptive with the bullnose. And I'll just go ahead and fast forward to the end. And you can see we've gotten rid of a lot of those stair steps. It's not perfect. And what we could do is reduce the maximum step down to, say, 0.25. And that reduces the fine step down to 25 thou. And that's just going to give us, again, a little bit less scalping. There's really no limit to how far you can take this with the caveat that one of the things that I've learned is that the key to good surface finish is you actually need to leave enough stock to let the next tool take a cut. In other words, running everything down to 2,000 or 5,000 stock to leave at every point in time isn't actually going to always help you. Nevertheless, if we take a look at this simulation, not bad. You can start to see and understand as the next tool, the ball end mill, surfaces over this, it's going to have less stair step intersections that are going to cause it to change and deflect. Everything deflects. That's one of the things I've learned. There's tool pressure on a soft material like aluminum, even in a rigid machine with a big heavy duty carbide end mill, it deflects. Tool pressure matters. Next up, let's do some surfacing. I have really found that scallop is a pretty awesome tool path to at least try or start with. Um, it's a little bit of a one size fits all. Uh, and if you want to click to a card here, Rob Lockwood talks through what's the ultimate tool path. And it kind of gets into some of the nitty gritty and understanding how to think about uh, what the toolpaths do or how they're created. With scallop, I'm going to select my tool and I'm going to step up to a 3 8 inch ball end mill. Now here's the thing, carbide is not cheap and I'm conscious of that. And I also love quarter inch tools most of the time. The reason I want to step up to a 3 8 inch tool here is for two reasons. One, it is going to be a lot stiffer and we've got some stick out here. Then the second reason is that the larger the diameter here, the larger of a radius we've got, which means the bigger we can increase our step over and with less scalloping. Meaning when we go in to edit our scallop, let's start with a step over of say 50 thou. Now let's duplicate this and let's compare what that looks like if we also did that same toolpath with a 3 16 ball end mill. The 3 16 ball end mill would simulate to looking like this with the 50 thou step over and that same 50 thou step over with a 3 8 inch tool which has double the diameter or double the radius is going to look all that much finer. One of the things I like to do especially with surfacing tool passes, leave the step over relatively big at first. This isn't how we're going to run it in the end, but it generates more quickly and it lets us worry about what I care about right now, which is let's look at the toolpath and understand how do I want this toolpath to move? So the first thing I notice is that we want to cut from the bottom up. The reason is that nothing good happens at the very bottom center of a ball end mill. There's less chip evacuation, there's less gullet. The grind, I think, changes a little depending on the tool. Uh, and most of all, you've got no surface footage as you approach the exact center line of the tool. I would rather do all my cutting up here on the side. The best way I found with scallop to do that is, ironically, not to change the up-down milling, but rather to change inside-outside, in this case, to go outside-in. What that'll do is machine from the outside in, which has the effect of walking up the part from the outside. With the exception of that first little move right there. Next thing I'm going to do 
right click, duplicate. I'm going to call this the copy. On my main one, I'm going to go to simulate and turn on show points. Every point is a line of G-code or a new motion control command. And what I'm seeing here is effectively going to be a lot of jerkiness. And here's the irony. If we reduce the number of points, your part is going to be slightly less accurate because again, instead of making a curve here and then a curve here, we're gonna make one curve between these two. And that's gonna change the technical accuracy or the technical geometry of your part. However, accuracy is not the same as surface finish and what I want the machine to do is move in this really nice fluid motion and not have this jerkiness where it's making small minor adjustments to the motion control uh, every so often. So by duplicating it, it lets us give us a quick comparison. I'm going to edit that scallop, turn on smoothing, and we'll set the smoothing say to 8 tenths, which is double the tolerance. Click OK. 8 tenths is 8 ten thousandths of an inch or about 0 0.02 millimeters, so quite a, quite a small amount. Now simulate that and show the points and compare that to that. It's actually not as different as I expected. So let's try changing the tolerance to one thou and the smoothing to two. Simulate, show points. Now we're starting to get fewer points. Now I don't have the answer for you here, I mean, I'm not sure that there always is an answer, but it's something I want you to at least be aware of or conscious of. And when you are done, we can reduce that step over. I would probably try running this tool with a 20 thousandths of an inch step over. There's always going to be some experimenting. The answers for surface finish aren't just in the cam here. Two things that come to mind. One, making sure you've got a really high quality tool with very little tool run out card here to our the when we did the lego mold and we were measuring tool run out to make sure we minimize that the other thing which i don't hear talked about very often is your coolant your coolant needs to not only be at the right bricks concentration to have uh, the optimal surface finish but it needs to be clean if you've got debris uh, or sediment even microparticles in your coolant that's going to turn into a form of uh, abrasive or sandpaper or, or something that's going to mar your surface finish. And finally, material. There's a big difference in where your material is sourced. And if you want a really good surface finish on an aluminum part, consider buying it from a supplier that's able to give you a certification that shows that it's made from a reputable aluminum company. You know, Kaiser would be a brand or a manufacturer of aluminum that comes to mind as a high quality reputable that's also made in the United States. So folks, with that, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Again, this video is as much about understanding some of the tools and tricks as it is the actual answers to surface finish. Take care. See you next Friday.